Yes, yesterday we showed you a beautiful image of, uh, of Pluto that was made uh, uh, just before the closest approach and sent to the ground as a part of those fail-safe data sets. Uh, today we're going to uh, show an image of a similar resolution on the big satellite, Sharon, and Deputy Project Scientist Kathy Olkin is going to discuss those results. So originally I thought Sharon might be uh, an ancient terrain covered in craters. Many people on the team thought that might have been the case. And so it, Sharon just blew our socks off when we had the new image today. So if we can pull it up so you can it's take there. a look at it. I don't, yeah. <laughs> We were just been thrilled all all morning. Uh, the team has just been a buzz. Look at this. Look at that. Oh my God, that's amazing. So I'll walk you guys through uh, some of the things we've seen in the image and tell you what we're thinking about. And I'm going to start uh, in the north and kind of work my way down. So. Uh, You've seen the darkish area uh, that is at the North Pole. And informally, we've been referring to that as Mordor. So, <laughs> so that's awesome. <laughs> so uh, Mordor is the darkish area near the pole. And you can see um, this is a natural color image. Um, and so the red around it, the red coloring that we've seen, extends um, beyond just the deepest, darkest part of that polar region, Mordor. And we think that the dark coloring could perhaps be a thin veneer. You can see um, locations at the North Pole where uh, a crater has perhaps uh, dug into that region and excavated underneath it. So you can see those brighter regions that may be craters, and so that's part of the reason why I say that we think it could be a thin veneer. So uh, let's see, there, and also you can see that that area is kind of a polygon shape, so there's, uh, and then the red color is more diffuse around it. Uh, moving down across uh, a little bit lower, going from the northeast to the southwest, is a series of troughs and, and cliffs, and that's just uh, striking to me. It's amazing to see this image. They extend about 600 miles across the planet, so this is a huge area, and it could be that it's due to uh, internal processing, and we will be looking at that in more detail. Um, just below that region, the, the line that you see cutting across from the northeast to the southwest, more east-west than north-south, uh, is a region where it's relatively smooth. There's less craters. So perhaps it's been geologically active or recently uh, resurfacing that area. Uh, so that's very exciting to see as well. Um, two features that I want to go back up a little bit higher on the... Uh, Near the top, at about the 2 o'clock position, you see a canyon. You can see a long, linear feature, and you can actually, at the very top, see kind of a notch where you're looking through to the space on the other side. And that canyon is really quite deep. It's about four to six miles deep. Um, I find that fascinating. <laughs> So it's a, it's a small world with deep canyons, troughs, cliffs, uh, dark regions that are still uh, slightly mysterious to us. Um, there's another canyon on the other side at maybe the 10 or 11 o'clock position, and that one is about three miles deep. There is so much interesting science in this one image alone. And we have higher resolution, a high, higher resolution image that we'll get that won't cover the whole uh, all of Sharon, but it'll cut across the northern part and uh, it, we'll get some of the dark area and then some of the middle area. And um, it's going to be about a factor of five better in resolution. Uh, so uh, as we've been saying, Pluto did not disappoint. I can add that Karen did not disappoint either. Thank you. Well, yesterday when we showed that beautiful image of, uh, of, of Pluto, um, we, we noted that we would have imagery with 10 times the resolution on the ground by today. 
And in fact, uh, uh, John Spencer is going to tell us about the first, just the first frame of that mosaic that's already down on the ground, and which has already uh, given us a big surprise. John? Thank you, Alan. Um, so yeah, we've got a whole bunch of high resolution observations now safely on board the spacecraft. And this is just a taste, just one small part of one of those observations. Um, and if I can have the, uh, the first slide, don't get excited yet. This is what you see. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you see, we saw yesterday, and this is a spectacular image. But um, we, we now are focusing in on small details on, on this amazing world. Um, before I go to that, I should say that we, we now have an informal name for the heart. It's, the heart is, a, is a, a good name, but we want to honor the discoverer of Pluto, and this is now, we are calling this Tombo Regio. So if I can have the slide back, um, we are now focus, going to focus on a small region just near the bottom of this image, which is near the day-night line where we have shading that throws the relief into sharp focus. And uh, uh, so we're going to be focusing on an area just a little bit to the uh, left of the bottom of the frame. And if we can now run the movie. Um, Okay, so we're, we're zooming in on this area. Here's the image, here it comes. <laughs> yeah, that was our reaction too. <laughs> um, so this is, this is a small part of a mosaic that covers the whole of uh, Tombaugh Reggio and regions around it, covering quite a variety of terrains. Uh, but this is one of the first things that really caught our attention. Um, this area, as you can see from the scale bar, is about 150 miles across. We're seeing features as small as half a mile here. You could see the APL campus on, on this kind of image. Um, the most stunning thing about this, well, there's many stunning things, but the most striking geologically is we have not yet found a single impact crater on this image. This means this is a very young surface um, because Pluto is being bombarded by other objects in the Kuiper belt and it's bound, craters happen. Uh, so we just eyeballing it, we think it has to be probably less than 100 million years old which is a small fraction of the four and a half billion year age of the solar system, uh, it might be active right now. Uh, with no craters, you just can't put a lower limit on how active it might be. Um, uh, these mountains here that we're seeing were quite spectacular. These are up to 11,000 feet high. Um, there may be higher ones elsewhere. Um, now, we know the surface of Pluto is covered in a lot of uh, Nitrogen, ice, methane ice, carbon monoxide ice. You can't make mountains out of that stuff. It's just too soft. It doesn't have the strength to make mountains. So we are seeing here the bedrock or the bed ice of Pluto. Uh, we're seeing the icy crust. Uh, water ice is strong enough at Pluto temperatures to hold up big mountains, and that's what we, we think we are seeing here. Um, so the, the nitrogen and the methane are just a coating on top of this icy bedrock, and we're seeing that here. Um, now. What's particularly exciting to me about this is, this is the first time we've seen an icy world that isn't orbiting a giant planet. All the other icy worlds we've visited have been moons of giant planets. And uh, we see strange geological features on many of these moons. And we often or usually attribute this to tidal heating, deformation of this, these worlds by the gravity of that giant planet and interactions with other moons. That can't happen on Pluto. There is no giant body that can be deforming Pluto on an ongoing regular basis uh, to heat the interior. Sharon is just too small to do that. So this is telling us that you do not need tidal heating to 
power ongoing recent geological activity on icy worlds. That's a really important discovery that we just made this morning. <laughs> um, 